You're listening to the Spin 10K a Day podcast, brought to you by the performance marketing experts at Mute 6. This is your source for cutting edge insight into the world of online advertising from the team with more Facebook case studies in 2016 than any other agency on the planet. Here are your hosts, Steve Wise and Stuart Anderson. Welcome back to the Spend 10K Day podcast. I am your host, Stuart Anderson. Today, just going solo, Steve Weiss will be back soon for one of our future episodes. Uh, we are pleased to be joined by the head of the Wolf Point Agency in New York, a leading Shopify Plus agency dedicated to creating great websites for Shopify Plus stores. John Murphy, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate you having me on the show. Absolutely. So obviously what we do on the Facebook ad side is super valuable for driving traffic, but we want to make sure that the traffic that we drive is converting well. And a big part of obviously having high converting traffic is having a high converting website. So uh, John, obviously there's a lot of things that go into it. Good design, a well-designed checkout flow. You know, Talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing out in the market right now that's really working, some of the trends you're seeing in e-commerce store design that you really like. And then maybe some of the things that uh, you think are either getting stale or aren't working too well. Yeah, we work, you know, hand in hand with a lot of pay-per-click agencies like uh, Mute 6. And, you know, it's kind of an in-tandem practice between um, making sure the website's doing its job when you're working so hard to get that paid traffic over. So um, we see, you know, a lot of things that come into play when it comes to conversion rate optimization. And it's not necessarily a one size fit all kind of solution there. I, I'm going to go through some best practices that we've seen and we've come across and, you know, our, our vast experience on the subject. But a lot of it is me uh, tweaking it to the specific industries the specific business, what kind of product you're offering, what kind of pricing. Um, and, you know, in particular, obviously, the website design comes into a uh, big play there. So um, I've seen kind of three big components, and the way I like to break it down is, one, the um, the overall website design, the, the second really being kind of the automated messaging that comes following, so kind of the post-purchase flow or anything that comes into the messaging trigger chart where, you know, your uh, automated messages are going out once people interact in different ways to the website. Um, and beyond that, kind of continually monitoring uh, the new traffic coming in, the trends that we're seeing in e-commerce in general, as well as, um, you know, kind of constantly refreshing the site for the, the new traffic coming in. So um, I'm happy to dive into to any of these different subjects here. So, you know, if you want to give a good place to start i'm happy to roll with it yeah absolutely i think you know we'll start with the first point you said you know we're focused on the overall website design obviously the first step i'm assuming in that is is you know analyzing what's going on with the current site and planning from there you know, talk to me a little bit about you know what are some of the things that if a store owner is considering a redesign you know what do you, what should they be looking at what are the specific metrics how should they be analyzing you know what to change or what to keep you know, what should they be looking at? Sure. Um, you know, and I think one place that a lot of people uh, overlook when it's coming in is is the capability and, and the ability to really um, reach how your customers interact in the site by using uh, heat mapping technology. Uh, a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of site owners will just rely on their Google Analytics, which is absolutely fine and even advanced kind of paid traffic, um, uh, page traffic analytics. But, you know, actually seeing and this is, you know, I'm referring to the screen record that most of these heat mapping softwares use, uh, actually seeing how someone interacts, clicking on, you know, specific sections, people are really, really weird. And we've never found kind of a consistent formula for every single user on the internet. So it really pays off to, uh, to watch, you know, customers flowing through the critical conversion driving pages uh, of a website in screen records. And, you know, what we like to do is an initial analysis that um, where we want to see at least a thousand visitors going through the home page, um, collections page, or, or category page, uh, the product page, and then through to checkout. And you know, as part of the home page um, viewing that we want to see, one of the critical things really is how they use the navigation. Uh, and if there's any kind of low hanging fruit um, where people are getting kind of caught up or having a, a problem finding the different items that they're looking for. So we really like to do that initial analysis. I think it's really critical. Some people just want to dive in and just start making changes, but 
you know, as much as best practices can guide you, your unique customers and your unique product um, really make an impact on it. So, you know, without seeing that viable customer data, it, you know, you're kind of just uh, firing blindly in the dark. Yeah, no, I completely agree. What are, you know, obviously you've probably done a lot of these analyses. What, what are some of the common threads you might see? You know, like what, what issues are usually sticking out in a lot of these stores you, you analyze? Yeah, and um, you know, I, I categorize this first one really as one of the the key entrepreneur you know problems that I see. Um, again, it kind of differs t- um, by industry. Sometimes this does actually pay off, but more often than not, I see entrepreneurs and, and site owners trying to jam um, a lot of content-based pages right in the main navigation. So they're taking up a lot of key real estate um, for you know things like kind of the about us, who we are, what our story is, those kind of pages, and the when we actually dive into the analytics um, and how people are interacting with the site, they get you know absolutely minimal traffic, like less than a percent uh, of the people coming in are actually clicking on, and even if they are clicking on, they're bouncing right off those pages. So you know, oftentimes one of the lowest hanging fruit, and that's really about with you know the direction we go with conversion rate optimization. We want to tackle the easy problems first, and then we get more nuance. But oftentimes you know people are giving away half their main navigation bar on these content pages no one's really clicking on anyway so um, again it's pretty industry specific if you've only got one or two products and it's a really interesting journey on how to get there it may be something that people are looking for but with big product sites and, and sites that are selling a lot you know it's really all about minimizing the amount of clicks uh, from when they enter the site to actually when they get to a purchasing decision yeah I, I, I was actually just having a conversation with somebody yesterday about this uh, there's I think one of my pet peeves that I see a lot of Shopify store owners doing especially is um, they'll have, as you said, several content-based pages taking up that valuable real estate in the app. They'll have about us, contact us, our story, uh, all these things that are of, we could say, I guess, disputable value, especially like a contact us form. Throw that in the footer or something like that. And, And to make room for them, They've actually taken what should be built out across the menu nav and put it in a drop down. So they have like shop and then a drop down with categories. It's like you want as much information or as, as many accessible options that are actual product focused up in that main navigation without having to click into, into a drop down menu. You want to really use that valuable real estate for stuff that you're selling. Um, so this is something I, I com- could not agree more with you on. It, it's, a, it's a huge issue, I think, that plagues a lot of sites. Yeah, and it it happens a lot, and you know, I guess where we see um, this happening the most is when um, companies and websites will have really grassroots up uh, upbringing, where you know pages had a meaningful impact when they were running their Kickstarter campaign, or um, you know, really growing from the ground up when they were a single product site, but then they grew into having dozens or hundreds or thousands of products, and they just never removed it. So we usually get a lot of kind of gasps and shocked reactions when we deliver our analysis and it's like 0.0225 percent of your traffic is actually clicking on any of these whereas everyone's having trouble you know navigating your main bulk shop drop down um and you know having having to click five or six times before they actually find the product that they want so uh, i'm I'm glad you're seeing the same thing on your end because it's uh you know you you can't really fault the entrepreneur for it but once they see the data it's kind of hard to argue yeah i i completely agree i mean I, the way i usually explain the concept to people is you know i think the about us or like our story is usually where there's the most dispute it's an ego thing you know if you're an entrepreneur you want people to know the story of how your business got started it's it's very important to you but what you have to understand is it might not be super important to somebody else and unless the story of how the business got started or how the product got built unless that's an essential part of the sales process, the buyer's journey, you really don't need to give it featured real estate. It just needs to be available somewhere on the site where if somebody's deeply, deeply interested in that, they could find it somewhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be in that main nav. 
Yeah, exactly. And I think it's, it's part of, you know, kind of a, a bigger pervasive problem where, um, you know, uh, content is very important and copy is, is very important throughout the site, especially for search engine rankings and indexing pages. But um, people oftentimes try to throw too much content, too much copy at people right off the bat, like cluttering up their homepage or cluttering up, uh, you know, their collections page. I know it used to be critical to the search engine, um, you know, rankings of collections page, but it isn't so much anymore. So, you know, what we've found is that yeah, exactly what you said, the people that really want to know that kind of stuff are willing to look around the site a little bit more. It doesn't necessarily have to be front and center, you know, one of those first few options they have to click on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, navigation is a, uh, when I do a lot of the CRO work and on-site experience work, when I consult or run experiments, I actually focus a lot on the navigation. So, uh, you know, one of the things I think, uh, is is pretty interesting that I see more and more sites trying to do is like you know things like mega menus. Um, I'm seeing them more and more. What are your thoughts on that from a user experience standpoint? I admittedly don't have as much data on success or comparison to like a traditional menu, but you know what what are you seeing in that space? Yeah, we're seeing a big trend towards um, mega menus uh, in general. Um, I think. You know, it's critical to make sure you're the right kind of business that has it. I mean, if you are in the territory of having a few hundred or a few thousand or tens of thousands of products, uh, it's, you know, it, it's definitely becoming a necessity. There, there's really no other way to effectively, um, you know, show that many products or allow people to kind of, you know, the typical mantra is you want people to be three clicks away from their purchasing decision from when they land on the site. So um, if you don't have a navigation that kind of supports that with that many products, you really need to make a shift. And that's what we're, you know, beyond kind of people take their, their main nav real estate with unimportant pages or unclicked pages, navigation issues are probably the biggest thing that we, the lowest hanging fruit that we change, um, you know, as kind of first and foremost. It takes a little bit of restructuring on the collections uh, and sub collections side of things usually, but, it, you know, it's well worth it, getting people to the pages they need uh, quicker, getting them to the products, because what we've found is a, a lot of times the days of, of just browsing people's sites are, are over with. Most people are comparison shopping where they have a good idea of what they want, unless you're a real lifestyle business that has this, this huge brand following. So uh, letting people get to the product that they want quicker, um, you know, and cutting down those kind of barriers to entry to, you know, getting through content pages and stuff like that. Those are, you know, the, the quickest, easiest things you can do to up that conversion rate. Yeah, you know, I, I really like to get a great soundbite in there about, you know, making sure that wherever somebody is on your site, they're always three, at, at most three clicks away from being able to make a purchasing decision. That's, uh, I mean, for our listeners, that's a huge takeaway to take from this interview. It's a great, great soundbite. So my question, though, is obviously, you know, for certain sites, that's very, very doable, very easy. If you have one product or only like a limited you know, catalog of products you're focused on, maybe you're a single product e-commerce company that had come off of a Kickstarter. You know, what do you do if you're a large catalog e-commerce company, if you're selling dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of products, what are the things that you can do? Maybe it's, uh, you know, good search, uh, good sorting and filtering. Like what are the, what are the most effective things people can do to create a good optimized experience for that type of business? Yeah, yeah, there are a few things, and I think a lot of it starts from that mega menu, and one of the, the best trends that I've kind of seen is, um, you know, words on a page are, are only kind of go so far, so what we've seen a lot of people doing is actually tagging the main, you know, collections and sub-collections pages within their mega menu with kind of the hottest selling item in that collections so when they hover over that specific like let's just take a home goods store um you know where where they typically see hundreds if not thousands of, of different products when they're hovering over bedding it shows you know a picture pops up of the most popular um you know product in that bedding category it takes some tagging on the back end but you know it's a re reinforcing people's um, you know, kind of mindset that they're, okay, I'm on the right sub collections. This is kind of what I'm looking for. So then, you know, that means they're landing on the page. They can find the, the subcategory, not just the category, 
um, you know, that they want to get to really quickly, really easily. That's really just the first click from when they're entering the home page. Then they're on the collections page. Then, you know, they, then they have the option to kind of filter things out effectively, which is another big thing we retool on a lot of websites is, um, you know, Amazon kind of drove the trend of people really being used to, especially on large product websites that they can kind of chop out all that excess fat, all those products that, you know, they know don't kind of apply to them, um, especially surrounding pricing rules. If someone's got, you know, a pretty hard, fast budget for two, three hundred dollars, let them just chop out that stuff that, uh, you know, that's above there. And then, you know, it's going to limit their product selection. Then the next click really is right on the product listing page and they're there to add it to the cart or, you know, depending on how you have it set up. That sounds great. I love that. Love that because that's something I, I honestly, and I'm a, a big believer in things like, you know, search, but like learning more about properly doing tag sorting, filtering. I mean, it's huge. It's something that I, I probably need to get better at myself as a CRO person. Um, so I want to I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about a huge huge topic these days. I mean, obviously, mobile has been. I think every year it's like this is the year mobile takes over, and it seems like you hear the same things. And mobile really is taking over. There's a, a few different schools of thought on you know how to approach mobile from a user experience standpoint, from a design standpoint. You know, what does your agency believe is the best way to approach the mobile user experience? Is it responsive design? Is it mobile first? Talk to me a little bit about what is you know best practices for you guys when de- developing a you know a, a store experience for the mobile browser. Yeah, I think um, you know what uh, what a lot of you know companies kind of come in and they have this mindset of um, you know I- I've got this really complex uh, desktop based design and I'm really trying to get every little ingrain detail over to my mobile experience, but you know they're kind of losing what really drives people's traffic. Uh, patterns and purchasing decisions in mobile, which is almost at every turn, every case that we've come across, it's simplicity. Uh, it's simplicity in the navigation. It's simplicity in you know being able to effectively search that home page without having to scroll endlessly through um, you know your your featured collection sections and those kind of things. So um, you know I've noticed really that. The mobile first approach uh, is effective for a lot of kind of specific, you know, larger product set um, companies. Oftentimes, we just can't take that same desktop design and and translate it over and expect it to be that effective. And I think you brought up a good point. I I hear that every year. Mobile's taking over. Mobile took over. It's there. You know, it's usually 50 to, you know, 60 percent of everyone's traffic from what we've seen. We, we actually have some clients where, you know, it's 90 plus percent uh, of their traffic already. So, um, you know, that a lot of times, you know, and I'm sure you know, this, this is your field of expertise, but it depends on the kind of the paid traffic they're driving. If they're doing a lot of, you know, Facebook mobile advertising, then, you know, it, it's safe to assume they're going to be driving the majority of traffic there. So it's really that kind of ease of use. So we were divided on the school of thought of, of mobile first versus just responsive because, uh, you know, you're in my industry, you're, you're juggling people's kind of upfront costs to do the build versus what they can do. But, you know, if the budget allows you're, you're doing a custom design, then, you know, we're, we're always creating new, you know, mobile comps that are specific and, you know, having people change out imagery because, you know, you just can't expect the same um, look that's going to work on a 15 to 26 inch display to, you know, function the same way on a tiny phone screen. And, and, you know, especially with all the different screen sizes out now, you just have to, you have to make some sacrifices and you really have to cut out a lot of fat. Absolutely. I I think we have some very unique, uh, kind of insights and approaches that we, we use for advertising, you know, doing paid traffic to mobile devices the user behavior of a mobile visitor and a desktop visitor are very different. And if you know how to, and more importantly, when to drive traffic to these people based on your existing analytics data, similar to the way that you look at how a site is performing and you're looking at certain areas and how it converts and what the user behavior is around that. We do the same thing actually when we look at uh, you know, shopper behavior on mobile devices versus desktop, desktop devices. So when we're, when we're measuring our traffic, um, let's say for a campaign, what we see for a lot of businesses and mobile is, is converting more. We are seeing more people check out on mobile, but still you're seeing a lot of browsing activity on mobile, especially throughout the day. People on their phones at work, maybe they take a quick break, they shop. And then you're seeing a lot of purchase activity during like, you know, lunch hours or after <laughs> work hours on a desktop or sometimes a tablet, but mostly on a desktop. 
And so we actually, for certain campaigns where we're like literally, you know, running things at heavy scale and we need more, even more efficiency than we're already getting, we'll actually day part ads so that we're actually showing more mobile traffic during the day to get that cheaper traffic where people are browsing. And then we'll prioritize desktop traffic maybe later in the day. Um, or, you know, we'll even just do day parting based on, you know, the volume of when people are checking out. We won't even necessarily bother too much with, with you know, devices and things like that. You can, you can get pretty sophisticated, but you have to be like, it, it, it takes a lot of, uh, there's a lot of moving parts there, obviously. But you can take that same approach as well, like when you're, when you're thinking about designing. I mean, obviously, if you want to be super thorough, you can do this. But, you know, if you think, hey, I want to build the mobile experience a lot around somebody who's going to be browsing, and then making sure that the checkout process, I mean, make it good on mobile, but make sure that checkout process is airtight on desktop. Um, that's something that we've kind of taken from a, a performance-driven standpoint. When we've been trying to build our own stores, building our own checkout funnels, uh, it's probably beyond what most people need to worry about. It's something that, like, it, it's one of those things that you really only need to be looking at when you're when you're doing significant scale. But still, I mean, it's it's you know along the lines of all the things that you've been saying today, which is really think about design not from what you think looks good, quote unquote, because good is subjective. Plan your design around something that fits your brand, but most importantly, fits your user experience. That's that's what you gotta, I think, that's what we focus on from an ad standpoint. I think that sounds like what you guys focus on as well from a, from a store design standpoint. Yeah, exactly. You know, two every two stores are always going to function differently just because of the the different customers. So, you know, that's why um, you know, not only kind of when we're redesigning from the ground up uh, and and we're taking that initial analysis, um, we really really encourage people to continue on with CRO after the fact, just because you know it's e-commerce. You know, one the trends are always changing. Two, the technology is always changing, especially. You know, with uh, with platforms like Shopify, I mean, they're they're releasing Shopify Pay soon, which we're all really excited about, where it's going to let people you know save their credit card information in uh, between Shopify stores. Um, and you know, their their release a little while back of of Apple Pay, which especially on mobile allows you know pretty much instant checkout capabilities, which has really kind of flipped the script and uh, and allowed uh, a lot more possibilities as far as that that quick checkout. But you know, it's really important to keep monitoring you know, how people are interacting with the site. And, you know, when we're working with, you know, companies like Mute6, we're driving different buckets of traffic. Um, you know, it's always important to kind of work in tandem and stay on top of it because, you know, you may have um, kind of reached a bit of a ceiling with a certain customer group. Now you're kind of poking around trying to find um, new avenues to pull customers to the website. So it's important that, you know, from a web design perspective, you know that new traffic that's going to be coming in. They may have different buying patterns. They may need different kind of, um, you know, kind of catering to their needs. So it, it's really a, a never-ending battle of, of just constantly changing the site and improving the site. And, you know, there's always more work to be done. I know, you know, website owners don't want to hear that. They want to, you know, think that, okay, we hit, it's perfect. It's going to be perfect forever now. I can stop spending money on it. But, um, you know, to be quite honest, the, the, the game never stops really of keeping up with trends and keeping up with new people coming to the website. Um, you know, it's just something you got to keep working at and, you know, A, B testing, looking at, you know, what we like to uh, take the approach every single month is you know, we're going to look at your, your data there. We're going to compile a new list of changes, however minute they might be. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to implement them. We're going to A, B test their effectiveness. If they're not showing positive effects on, on CRO, we're going to roll them back. If they are, we're going to push forward with them. And then it's, you know, it's seeing what's working best and really diving in on that. So you scratch the surface, something works, you keep pushing with it. Yeah, completely agree. Okay, so we have a few minutes left. I want to give you a chance to say any, any final thoughts, like if, if you had any parting wisdom for our listeners, they're trying to improve the conversion rates on their stores. You know, what is your kind of final message to them on what they should be doing right now, something they should be focused on, something they should be looking out for? Sure. Um, yeah, and, and uh, I'm going to open a bit of a Pandora's box here because it's, it can be a deep dive on a subject. But two things I see that are, are really, really overlooked are, um, you know, the automated messaging uh, on people's sites. They, you know, they really kind of let things like order confirmation page, uh, confirmation emails, your order has shipped. They really don't utilize those enough. Um, and I think a lot of people's mindsets on conversion rate optimization is all about getting that customer to convert for the first time. But people so much overlook 
the fact that you know it costs significantly less to get a current customer to actually repurchase than it does to get a new customer coming in to repurchase uh, to purchase for the first time. So you know I encourage people every touch point that you have, no matter how kind of mundane or regular it seems, to try to get in you know a goal, kind of either promotional aspects, referral programs, loyalty programs, anything. It, um, you know, anything that it takes to really get people to repurchase. Um, and, you know, I could go on and on about this, but, you know, just if I can give you one message to kind of take away from that is, you know, don't just think that the process stops once they make their first purchase. It's actually opening up a whole new door for cheaper repurchases. And I think it's one of the biggest things that we see um, when we're coming into a new business that people have neglected and really haven't put any effort towards. Awesome. I love that. Couldn't agree more. I mean, we, we, do, we do a lot of advertising for retention and existing customers. So I love the points there. Uh, John, I also want to give you a chance to, to plug Wolfpoint a little bit. I mean, we were really appreciative of you joining us today. We'd love to give you a chance to uh, talk a little bit about your agency. Great, great. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, we're a point agency. You can find us at wolfpointagency.com or searching us on the Shopify experts listing. Um, you know, we really do focus on Shopify and Shopify Plus as, as our primary avenue there. Um, we don't really just stop at the website design, as you can probably figure out from the segment here. We really like to continue on, continually optimize uh, our clients' websites for conversion. We do automated messaging, email design, that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, just continuing on that funnel, continuing on that that uh, lifestyle kind of purchase, uh, you know, um, cycle that, that doesn't end at that first purchase. So, you know, we're here to help you with strategy, web design, uh, and marketing going forward. So I really appreciate you having me on here and, and, and uh, letting me say my piece. Oh, of course. Of course. We loved having you. And again, this is John Murphy. He's the CEO of, of the Wolfpoint Agency. You can find them at wolfpointagency.com. John, thank you so much for being here. And to our loyal listeners, we appreciate you tuning in for another episode of the Spend 10K a Day podcast. We will be back again soon with more great Facebook ads and e-commerce content. Thanks for joining us.